Uh, the name of the message or the title of the message this morning is Having the Father's Heart. And so we'll talk about what it is to have a heart that's given to God. But first I want to read, I want to do my uh, due diligence with my uh, weekly reading of a meme. I bet that happens in very few churches, right? The reading of a meme. This morning's meme is... I want to find I want to find the right one or oh, a right one. All right, this is good enough. This is from James 4:8. It's found throughout the Bible, actually. Like I said this morning, Old Testament, New Testament. In principle, it's everywhere in the Bible. It says, "Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your heart, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, your hearts, you double-minded." I forgot that that statement was in there and it's very relevant to what I'm going to talk about this morning. So let's read it again, a little clearer this time. Taken from James chapter, chapter 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Hmm. All right. So what is the heart of man? When we speak of the human heart, what do we talk about? Uh, a muscle that's about a year big that governs the flow of blood throughout your body. That's the heart, that's the human heart. But when we talk about the heart of man, what are we talking about? Something that's related to the soul of man, right? I, I, I want to I give a, 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 just a definition of, of what the heart is. The heart is the outward reflection of our soul. So we all have, each of us, we have souls. And what our souls is what, what our souls reflect is actually the manifestation of our hearts. So our our hearts will reflect what's in our souls. The heart of a man, the, the core of a of a man deals with where our souls are. So the state of our soul will reflect. And this is what we call the heart of man. Can you see the heart of a person? Can you experience or witness the heart of a person? And the answer is yes. If you, if you stay close to them, if you observe them enough, you will witness their heart. You will see their heart. And what you're actually seeing is the reality of where their souls are. This, the, this, the state of their souls is what you will see when you see the heart of a person. Now, in regards to the human heart, the Bible gives us that we should guard our hearts, to watch over, to, to, to manage, in other words, our hearts. And what does that tell us? It tells us that we have the capacity to govern our hearts. It tells us that we should make choices in regards to our hearts. Now, what we just read from James chapter 4, verse 8, you know, I got up this morning looking for references that I can relate to or, and use. I didn't even think of James chapter 4, verse 8, where James said what he said concerning the heart. God expects us to yield our hearts to him and therefore give our hearts to him. This is what God wants from us. He wants us to give our hearts to him. And that's a choice that we must make. That's, that's a very important choice. And I want to tell you that it's a difficult thing to do, to fully give our hearts to God. And why would that be? Why would that be that we would have difficulty truly giving our hearts to God? Because of insecurity. Quite often in, in life, people are, in many cases, horribly hurt by people circumstances, life difficulties, brings hardship. And sometimes, and I think in many cases, if you've experienced a lot of disappointment and hurt, it's difficult even to give your heart fully to God. It's, 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 it's something that you really have to apply yourself in order to do. And as difficult as that might be for many of us, it is absolutely essential that we find it within ourselves to fully give our hearts to God and trust Him in a way that God wants us to trust Him. 
And when we do, then we can truly draw near to God. And I think that's why James made that reference to the heart of man and drawing close to God. Because drawing close to God, truly, truly drawing close to God means that you can trust him. And you're not, you're not insecure about being disappointed or being hurt by God. As man would hurt you, God will not. You may not always have things the way you want it with God, but he knows what's best for us. So we can trust him. You see, we, we have to learn to not trust upon our own understanding and our own determination as to how things must go. That's a very important aspect of truly, truly giving our hearts to God. You know, the thing about the human soul and the heart of man, it is not something that can be easily hidden. You cannot hide your heart. It reflects who you are. It reflects your soul. Your core essential being reflects through your heart. And if anyone has any bit of true discernment, you can't hide your heart. Your heart is always revealed. Oh, many people do well in trying to cover it up, to present it in a way that it truly isn't. Now, I recommend that in regards to our hearts, that we be pure and honest as we possibly can be pure and honest about our hearts. Let, in other words, let our hearts truly reflect the condition of our souls and, and, and avoid pretense as it relates to our hearts. Our hearts must reflect the, the actual state of our being. Now, the Proverbs, so we, we're going to read from the Proverbs this morning, Proverbs chapter 4. It was actually this, this, this passage that led me to to. to excuse me, to, to present this to you this morning. Again, this is not the typical message that I would give. I, I do encourage people strongly in this regard when it comes to personal counsel and one-on-one, and -on -one. but this is for all of us this morning, including myself. So I read here in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 to 24 this week, and that's exactly what led me to, where, to what I'm doing this morning. So let's read what Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 4. Watch over your heart with all diligence. So what, what is he saying? To guard, you've heard that statement before, to guard your hearts, to watch over your hearts with all diligence. In other words, this is something we have to be deliberate and constant about. Be diligent to watch over your heart, to sift the, the thoughts of your mind, your heart. Watch over it. For from it flows the springs of life. Now the word there that's used in the Hebrew for springs is very interesting. Who has a King James? What does it say in the King James? Springs? Issues of life. So, so when we think of the issues of life, what do we think about? I, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a, 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 a dig into a word here. The word that's actually used in the Hebrew is totsar. Totsar. It's the best that I can, uh, can transliterate it. Totsa. When you think of an issue, what do you think of? I have an issue with my car. I have an issue with my family members. I have issues with... That's what we think of, right? Issues. There's another application for the word issue, and that is what? What comes from something? That, that's, the, that's a more accurate definition of the word issue. For instance, uh, you might have, like Larry had a womb that, from his surgery, that continued to issue substance. And it's healed up now, and so praise God. So that substance that came from that womb is the Hebrew word totsar, issue. So you understand why the word springs would be used in the King James, in the New American Standard. But we have to look at the word carefully. It literally means to, to, to spring, to issue out from. Another word that's used is to escape, a source from where something escapes. So let's read that again with that in mind. For from it, referring to the heart, flows the 
issues, the springs, what escapes of life. In other words, folks, who you are on the inside will issue forth from your heart. Your heart will reflect what's really happening inside of you. And for all to see, God wants us with a pure heart so that what's reflect is pure and real. You, you have no hidden agendas. Who you are on the inside is clearly being reflected outwardly. Totsa. It's being issued forth for all to see. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put, put devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead. Let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Now verse 25 and 26 is very, very poignant to what we're talking about this morning. Typically when we think of the issues of the heart, those verses don't align perfectly with it. But when you look at this, the way that I'm presenting it this morning, you see that the verse 25 and 26 is very relevant to the issues of our heart. Because again, what's on the inside will reflect through our hearts. And therefore, Solomon is encouraging us to be very careful about being devious, being secretive about your feelings. We should all be very open about our feelings. And don't hold little hidden things that will ultimately cause your heart to become clouded and corrupt. We are to be as little children. One thing about little children is that you know exactly where their hearts are at, don't you? Nothing is hidden. You don't see any pretense, any deceit, do you? That comes as we get to be in our teens and later on in life. We, we learn to do those things. But the heart that God creates in every human being is void of deceit initially and deception and darkness. Again, those are learned things. And when they exist, they're very, very manifest. So the key for us is to be as little children. And that's why Jesus said to come on to him as a little child. So that the issues of our hearts will be manifest and clear. This is important. When we go before God ultimately, whether it's at the judgment seat of Christ or the judgment seat of God himself, wherever we go, the issues of our hearts will be considered. This is what will be brought to light the deepest, most remote issues of our hearts will be addressed. So our challenge now is to ensure that these issues, the spring that our heart is, is clear. Its waters are clear and cool without any, without any defilement. Now that sounds easy, and I'm making it sound easy. It's a difficult thing to do. The key is to keep close to God. Stay close to him. Know his will for your life. Hear his voice and obey him. And as you do, your spring will remain clear, pristine and clean. Let's talk about King David. King David is a wonderful archetype of the believer in the Bible. He's a, in other words, he's a, he's a type of who we should be. The heart of King David is the heart that we're supposed to have. Was King David perfect by any means? Was he without fault, without sin? Was his heart right before God? Ah, yes. His heart was right before God. God sought for himself someone someone whose heart was like his. And we're going to read that, that verse here in 1 Samuel chapter 16 here in a moment. But God sought for someone whose heart was like his own. And he found King David. David's heart was clear. The issues of his heart was 
pure before God. Even though he transgressed and transgressed horribly, he broke just about every commandment with one sin. <laughs> now that's efficiency, right? King David, with one transgression, broke just about every commandment. Let's read what, what it says in 1 Samuel. Actually, I think it's 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. What's the backdrop to the story here? King Saul has proven himself to have a corrupt heart. The issues of his heart was never pure before God, even though he did as best as he could to create a nice external image, particularly an external image to Samuel, his heart was revealed that he didn't love God. And we'll get to that most important fundamental fact, that Saul did not love God, truly love God. There were other things in his life that he loved more than God. Who can name one thing? One thing that King Saul loved more than God himself. Right. The people, well, that stemmed from his fear. He didn't truly love the people. If he loved the people, he would have obeyed God. Who can think of one thing that King Saul loved more than God himself? Power, that comes from fear as well. He loved Jonathan more than God. His greatest concern was, was his heritage, his son. That's, that's what Saul loved. And that's clear and obvious. When he began to lie to his whole family and Jonathan about King David, that's the lie he, he, he provided. That Jonathan, King David, is after your position. So you must help me in eradicating King David. You see, Saul had no love. His heart was impure because he did not love God. Had he loved God more than he loved Jonathan, then you would have seen a different reflection of the soul of King Saul. You would have seen a purer heart. His heart was impure. So key is for us to know that we must love God beyond and above everything if our hearts are to be pure before him, if we are to reflect a good, pure heart, as King David did, we ought to love God above and beyond everything. And hence, we have what is called the greatest commandment, which is, what is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. Those three things are in accord, folks. There are three aspects of the same thing. The soul. The mind is the comprehension of the soul. The processing of the soul and its thoughts. The heart is the reflection of the soul. So love the Lord your God with a fully reflected heart and a mind that's completely given over to God where your thoughts are always on God. Does the enemy challenge you? Would the enemy challenge you in this regard? Absolutely. There will be a constant battle on this particular battlefield. He will challenge you day in and day out. If you set yourself in your life to have a heart after God, as King David did, if you do so, know that you will have resistance but do not be afraid of the resistance because the more you give your heart to God, the weaker the devil becomes. The more you love God is the less power the evil one will have on your life. I want to make that promise to you. It's a solemn promise. I'm saying that with absolute confidence. If it is a faithful word, it will not fail you. The more you love God, the weaker the enemy will be in your flesh. Amen. And that's why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But then he said, the one who loves me is the one who keeps my commandments. And what did he go on to say after that? Anyone knows? What did Jesus go on to say after he made that statement? And I will have fellowship with him and my father and I will come and visit with him. 
because you love God. We have to love God as King David loved God. So in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul is being rejected by God. Why? Because his heart is not given to God. His heart is placed in places that it should not be. Now, we know that Saul again had great concern for the future of his son, Jonathan, and tried in his own strength to prepare the future of Jonathan's life. This was his demise. It was also the demise of Jonathan. When did Jonathan die? Moments before Saul did on the battlefield. This is the end of putting our love where it should not be. When we try to control our destiny, Saul made a horrible mistake and paid the ultimate price. Had Saul gained some wisdom and some courage to follow after that wisdom, in other words, if Saul said, had, let's, let's say Samuel came to Saul and said, Saul, God wants you to love him wholly. Your love for Jonathan and your family is getting in the way. Put God first, which perhaps Samuel may have said to him at some point. And if Saul said, yes, Samuel, you're absolutely correct, but first I'm going to set before God and make that clear in my mind because I don't quite get it. And Saul really and genuinely placed himself before God, and then God quickened in him the reality of what Samuel said. Had that happened, and Saul then therefore appropriated that in his life and began to love God more than his son, love God more than anything else, what would God have done with Jonathan? What would have happened? What, what, what would have been the end of it had Saul truly surrendered himself to God and loved God more than anything else? God would have championed his existence. God would have helped his life. God would have blessed him and blessed his son as well. Instead, they both died a horrible death on the battlefield. What does that tell us? Do not try to possess the things that you cannot. Do not try to possess the things that your heart demands you to. Give them to God and God will in fact bless you in a way that only He can. If you try to hold on too closely to the things you love in your own strength, you will bring nothing but discourage, but, but disappointment and perhaps even destruction upon your life. God wants you to yield everything to him and to love him fully. So God now, he turns to King David. But now your kingdom shall not endure, speaking to Saul. This is Samuel. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So had Saul perfectly loved God, he would have obeyed God. He would have kept God's word, but he did not. And as a result, God sought someone who would have a heart after him. In other words, a heart like God, pure, reflected purely, pristine, as a spring, clear, without any contaminants. This is what God wanted. And he found that in King David. King David has a, had, a, had, a, had a heart like a child. A bear and a lion came after the flock. And what did he do? He did not run off in fear. He planted his feet and stood against the animals that, thre that threatened his flock. Knowing that God was with him. He, he, he approached the, 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 the animals of prey, the, 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 the bear and the lion as if they had no hope, they had no chance, because God was with him. We know that because when he, when he confronted uh, Goliath, his statement was, God helped me to destroy a bear and a lion. So who is this Philistine? You see, this is how pure his heart was. He was so convinced of God's goodness and God's love and mercy that he depended on, he put his life on it. That's the heart of God. So God sought someone who had a heart like himself. Not a fearful heart, 
not a deceiving heart, not a heart that's cluttered with secrecy, shame, unseen agendas, but a heart that, that's fully exposed and fully revealed. This is what God wants, and this is what he saw in King David. Now, what can we say about King David? Reflecting this perfect heart, I guess I can say a perfect heart. King David reflected a perfect heart. Did he live a perfect life? No, he didn't. But he hated sin, didn't he? When you read the Psalms, all of his Psalms, it's, it's reflected. He hated unrighteousness. He hated the deeds of the flesh of the natural man, which always pointed to sin. He hated it. When you read Psalm 119, which is pretty pretty lengthy psalm, Psalm of King David, what do you see? You see his love and his passion for God's commandments, God's law. But you also see reflected in the words of the psalm his need for God to sustain him in even doing the right things. He wasn't ashamed to openly admit that he needed God even for the carrying out of the righteousness, which negates completely that somehow there was something innate within him that led him to righteousness. He was honest about his frailty. He was honest about his sin tendency. He didn't pretend to be upright when he knew in his heart that he was not. That's one of the wonderful things of King David. He hated sin, even the sin that existed within himself, and he exposed it in his songs. Read the Psalms. You will see it. In many, many of the Psalms, you see King David agonizing over that inner man that wanted to transgress against God. And he was free enough, his heart was pure enough, to come right out and state his state of being. <laughs> to state his condition, the condition of his heart. He gained God's favor because of that. See, this is the heart that's after God. A heart, a heart that's pure. A heart that's willing to be exposed. And that, I think, is very important. That we should be always willing to have our, complete, our heart completely exposed. No secrets. Our lives are open books. We wear, we wear it all on our sleeves for everyone to see. Without shame. This is the heart that pleases God, friends. King David, what else do we see about King David? The one whose heart was after God. Like God's heart, that's what it says. What do we see? He was obedient to God, perfectly obedient. On the battlefield, whenever God led him into battle, he was very careful and deliberate to wait on God. We see very few instances in the Chronicles or in, this, in the books of Samuel where King David went before God. He went ahead of God. He always waited carefully for God's approval, for his direction. This is obedience. He had an obedient heart. What about when he was confronted with sin? When Nathan the prophet came to him and, and spoke to him about what he was doing with Bathsheba and with Uriah the Hittite, how did David respond? Could David had just neutralized the prophet as all the other kings did? Could he have just get rid of the messenger? Of course he could. Of course he could. He could have nullified Nathan the prophet. He was king. Everyone would have supported him. He's king. He has a right to take Bathsheba if he wants and to put Uriah at the head of the battle so that Uriah would be alleviated. He had the right to do that. He was king. But rather, when he was confronted, he humbled himself immediately. He was confronted in the worst way, right? You know the story. But King David humbled himself and repented and did not, did not consider his position as king above that of the prophet because the prophet spoke for God. This is the heart of King David. We know that the other, the other kings, most of them, they killed the prophets. They did. 
If the prophets would prophesy something that they didn't like, well, we must get rid of the prophet. You know, if that preacher preaches something that, that irks me, if he's right or wrong, I don't care. He's got to be fired. We got to we gotta rein him in. We got to do something about him. He's meddling too much. That's the tendency of the fallen man. That's the tendency of the one who lives in sin. Does not want the depths of his heart to be exposed, even by the prophet, by the one who preaches. You, see, you follow what I'm saying? It's very important for us to be willing to be confronted with our sin. It pleases God because we show that we have a heart like God. And is there any one of us here who isn't susceptible to unrighteous, an unrighteous heart? Is there any one of us here with a pure heart? Only as we surrender it to him. Only as we live with our hearts fully and completely exposed before God can we have a perfect heart, as King David did. So King David readily repented when confronted with sin. He did not pretend. Pretentiousness is a sign of a broken heart, a, a foiled heart. Actually, pretentiousness is reflected through the heart it is a sign of a broken soul, a fractured soul. When we depend upon pretense, we should never be in such a place because our souls are not to be fractured. If, and in fact, in life, folks, we will, from time to time, attain a fractured soul. Life does that. When, we, when our souls are fractured, we seek healing for our souls. We don't pretend that it's not. If you try to pretend that your heart isn't, isn't affected, it will lead you to that place of reflecting through your heart what is not pure. So if your soul is fractured, be open about it. Don't say, well, I'm a deacon, I'm an elder, so I'm not supposed to let people know that I'm in such a place. I have to maintain a certain reflection, a certain image. Don't take such a position. King David didn't. He was king. But when it came down to it that his soul was fractured, he wanted everyone to know he wasn't hesitant for it to show. Didn't pretend. And that's the heart that pleases God, folks. How do we overcome uh, the tendencies of, of, a, of a heart that wants to reflect unreality concerning our souls? In other words, how do, we, how do we rein in a heart that's unwilling to reflect the reality of our souls? What do we do? Well, we allow God's fire to purify our hearts. I'm talking about the fires of affliction. Don't always see difficulty as something that, that spells your detriment. The fires of trials and tribulations are there to purify you, to enrich you, to purify your soul. And if your soul is pure, what will your heart reflect? Purity. The issue, what comes forth from your heart, will be pure if your soul is pure. A good fire will purify your soul. Trials and tribulation, in other words. Many times when we begin to experience trials and tribulation, we run to God or we begin to rebuke the devil because we don't want them. I don't blame you. I don't blame you for not wanting trials and tribulations, but understand that they serve a purpose in the fallen man. They can flush out. They can purge the heart or the soul. And sometimes it's necessary in all of us. I've been through it. It's not pleasant. It's painful. But it is necessary for us to reflect a soul that's been purified by fire. Our hearts will testify to it. I said just now that we ought to be open books completely. 
open books. One of the things that I have difficulty with, and this is me now personally, is dealing with people who has clearly little hidden agendas in themselves towards, towards myself and other people. I see it. It really irks me, and I don't quite know always how to deal with it, and I have to continue to train myself to deal with it head on, as the psalmist said, straightforwardly. I have to continue to train myself to deal with that. Now we're talking about the deep, meddling things of us human beings. Seeing in the heart of someone, or seeing reflected through the heart of someone, a soul that's prone to deceit, deception, hidden things, and dealing with it. That's tough. It's tough enough for me to deal with it in myself. It's difficult to deal with it in other people, but I have to deal with it. I have to confront it whenever it exists, whenever I see it, and I have to do it. And so it's my position to do it, by the way. You say, whoa, we've gone too far. Who do you think you are? Only your pastor. Only your pastor. The one that watches over your soul. Recognizes your heart. Sees what's on your heart. That's who I am. I don't claim to have a perfect heart, a perfect reflected soul. I don't claim it. But I know what's necessary. I know what the balm is for that particular affliction. And I want to point you to that constantly. So maintaining the heart, the heart of God, that's what I want to talk about right now. First of all, we must, like I said earlier, give our hearts completely to God. Give your hearts fully to God. Your relationship with your wives and husbands. What happens if you don't give your hearts fully to them as it relates to that human-to-human -human relationship? What happens if you don't fully give your hearts to your husband and wife or, or wife? What happens? Your relationship is impeded. Your relationship will never ascend or get to a place where you can have true oneness as a husband and wife if your hearts are not completely given to each other. And that's the truth. It's simply the reality of, of the condition of us human beings. A marriage where hearts are not fully given to each other is almost destined for destruction, will fail horribly. Oh, in many cases, the marriage might sustain. Uh, there might be an agreement between you and, you, and, you and your spouse to keep the marriage, to sustain the marriage, but the marriage will never be what it could be if you're not fully given over to each other. Now, that simple reality applies also to our relationship with God. We must fully be given over to God, and if we are, God will fully be given over to us. And this is important for us to understand. God will fully give himself to us if we, in turn, give ourselves fully to him. And that's what is meant when the Bible says to draw near to him. And he, in turn, will draw near to us. Let's read that meme again that I read earlier this morning that I didn't know was so relevant to my message. And this is from James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This is exactly the issue of the heart. Cleanse your, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. <laughs> James didn't mince words much at all, did he? So, it is for us to cleanse our hearts, to purify our hearts, to watch over our hearts, to ensure that our hearts are pure and reflect in what our souls are really experiencing. It's, it's an essential. Again, I'll repeat myself. You know I have no problem with that. Let me repeat myself. If you somehow think that you can reflect a heart that's not indicative of what's happening in your soul, you are self-deceived. You are not dealing with reality because your heart will inevitably and always reflect what's happening in your soul. It's by God's design. 
It is by his very design. You cannot fake it. You can suppress it and pretend, but you're not fooling anyone. And that's the reality. And sadly, people can live their entire lives in that place. And no one is bold enough or determined enough to confront you. My goal is to be that determined and that bold. When I see it in you, to confront it. God wants you to have a pure heart before him. Where the issues of your heart are good and holy and pure unto God. So certainly guard your hearts. Be careful about what your mind is, is processing, folks. I want to I echo that again. The mind is sort of the, the monitor or, the, or, or, or the, 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 yes, the monitor. You know, think of a computer. The mind is the monitor of what's happening in your core essential being, in your soul. So, so be careful about what's popping up on your, on your monitor. We have a keyboard that's before us. We can determine what comes up, whether it be good or evil. So we have to guard our, our, our souls by ensuring that what's on our mind is good and pure. Minds that are wholly given over to Christ, wholly given over to him. Didn't Paul say something like that? Absolutely he did. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ. Have the mind of God. What your heart reflects will be what's in your soul and what's on your mind. It never fails. So I want to encourage you, simple message this morning, but I want to end by encouraging you to give your hearts fully to God. Fully to God. I feel led to say, to, I feel led to say something here. Um, many, many times as it, as it relates to faith, Bible faith, we confuse actual faith with just unwise determination. Because in order for faith to be pure, there has to be wisdom. Wisdom is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's in alignment with faith. So I'm not sure why I'm interjecting this right here. Be wise about faith. Sometimes we see just a dogged determination. I'm going to do it no matter what type approach as faith. And in many cases, it's just unwise. And your faith is, and that faith is, is tainted by your lack of wisdom. So I'm not sure what that had to do with anything relevant to the message, but I want us to hear that. For some reason, God wants someone to hear that. But back to the issue of the heart, what the heart reflects. We must reflect pure hearts. And the only way for us to do it is to have pure souls. Like King David. When no pretense, when confronted with sin, we repent. When dealing with God, we're perfectly obedient. We hold nothing back. We let everything show. We wear our lives on our sleeves. And we're not afraid to show it. This will always point to a pure soul and reflect a pure heart. Amen? So I think it's important for us to hear this. I think, I, I typically won't present this in a message, but I, I would talk about these things and council meetings type things. And, uh, but I think as a congregation, we need to hear this because as a congregation, we have a heart. It, it means that as a congregation, we have a soul. The, the, the core essential being of who we are is reflected through our heart. So let me ask one question before we part. As a congregation, what does our heart look like? Willing? Yeah. As a congregation, think about it. As a congregation now, as a whole, what does our heart look like? How is our heart reflected?
Well, let me, sh let me share with you how our hearts should reflect. As a congregation of people who absolutely loves God, loves his word, a people that will put everything aside to intercede on behalf of others, a praying congregation, a heart of a praying congregation, these things are the things that our heart as a congregation should reflect. And not just one or two of us, you know, the praying ladies, the ones we turn to when we need something prayed for. But no, each of us fully engaged in the reality that we are a praying congregation, a congregation of people who love God and who will obey God and stand upon his word. You see, the heart of the congregation should be no different than my heart or your hearts. Our hearts as a congregation must reflect. Now, I'm not sure if as a congregation we will stand before God as one congregation and give an answer. I don't think so. Perhaps, I don't know. I'm not sure what that would look like. But I know certainly as individuals we will stand before God and give an account for the issue of our hearts. What our hearts put out. What our hearts reflect. I know that without any question. That's just the fact of life, or the fact of the end of this life. Paul said it. For me, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. To give an account for what we've done. He's referring to the issues of the heart, of course. In the body, whether good or evil. So this is a reality. We'll, none of us will escape it. None of us. I think of Jean before she passed. Jean struggled a lot with condemnation. She grew up as a Catholic. Her transgressions, and this is one of the wonders of Jean, she never held back to confess her sins. And this was a powerful asset. But it also reflected that she was living condemned in her spirit. It was only a week or so before she died that she was set free. Within the week following that moment when she was set free, fully, fully and truly set free, she lost her, com her mental composure, she became demented, and then she died. That's God's grace. Jean, Jean walked with us for many decades, condemned in her spirit, and it showed. Her heart reflected her condemnation, this the fact that she was inwardly condemned. And she walked that way until moments before she died. Well, days before she died. What does that tell us? Quite a bit. That God did not want Jean coming before him condemned in her heart. He didn't want that. He wanted her to deal with the issues of her heart before she came to him. And she did. So don't wait until it's five days before you pass. Deal with it now, throughout your life, from day to day. Deal with the true issues of your heart. Reflect, be as King David. Reflect what's upon your heart. And don't try to shroud it with deception and pretense. It just puts you in a bad place. So let's pray, God, we thank you, Lord, for the love and the mercy that you've shown us. God, we ask that you would lead us in the way of truth in the way of reality, Lord. Let our hearts reflect the, re the reality of where our souls are and who we are. And God, we depend upon you for our strength. God, we confess that apart from you, Lord, we will unravel and come to nothing. We need your intervention. We need your strength. And Father, we praise you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you did not exact upon us the penalty of our unrighteousness. But you brought that upon your son, a perfect lamb, providing life, being held guilty when he was fully innocent. And you did this, Father God. This is your love. This is a picture of your mercy. And we thank you, Lord, for this. And God, we ask that you will quicken us so, so, so exactly, so powerfully, that, Lord, we will walk fully reflecting what's within our souls. And help us, O oh Lord, to walk before you straightforwardly on a straight path. Not turning to the right or the left, 
but steadfast in every way. And God, we need your help. We need your power. And we bless you, Father God, and your Son, Jesus. Amen.